Satan of Max, because Max is the force, one of the forces behind the Nature Narrative series, and he will explain a little bit more about this uh, concept. And uh, then I give Tom all the space he needs. After Tom, we have a Q&A. So please do join the conversation because we are here. Um, we are delighted to have Max again on stage because he will uh, do his flutes intermezzo with his uh, friend George. And after this like wonderful uh, flute magic tunes, uh, it's time to ask two more beautiful spirits on stage. That will be Sherlene Sanchez. Uh, she is here on behalf of the Earth Charter Netherlands and Touch of Spirit, and Serf Wimers. Our Wimers is here also on behalf of Foundation Nanai. Uh, so they will be deliberating together about the Iroquois message. It's, stand, it's written there Iroquois message, but I got like a new, uh, a new name because this is even more accurate. Uh oh, <laughs> let me try to do this. It's actually called the Hodenoshani. Thank you. There is, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, the structure of the program, of course, we are here storytellers. So, I have a program, but, but for sure, we were talking more freely, more uh, from the heart. So, let's make that clear. Okay. Please, Max, enlighten us about the nature narratives. Thank you. <laughs> um, I will keep it quite short. I was asked uh, from Antoine Dill, who couldn't make it today due to circumstances, who was one of the initiators of this series, uh, to tell something about it, because we have been organizing uh, several editions now. This is the fifth one. And basically, the, uh, I mean, Celine, you've already mentioned a lot, so I can keep it shorter as well. Because of the problems of climate change, but also the lack of different perspectives being inside the series, uh, we wanted to give this space because I think when we look at uh, yeah, a lot of European NGOs around sustainability, uh, they are either uh, very wide or uh, oriented towards a lot of technical solutions. So think of solar panels, windmills, but uh, not a lot of times a fundamental s uh, system critique or about capitalism, colonialism, which has gotten us here in the first place. So uh, to reflect on uh, the way uh, we relate to ourselves, to nature uh, and to our culture and system is important. Uh, and I like, Celine, that you really tried, yeah, take effort to pronounce these names because I think that's what we need to do, it's maybe uncomfortable or, you know, it's, it's something new. But I think if we want to not recreate the problems, we need to take an extra effort to pronounce these names and beyond that, see what other perspectives are there, um, which are not known uh, maybe to us in common life. Um, and I think, yeah, last editions were a lot on uh, climate justice and injustices and the way different peoples were impacted. So I'm happy on this edition is uh, is more focused on uh, sharing the yeah the the the, the ways and visions uh, of indigenous peoples um, f specifically from the U.S. Um, or I guess the U.S. is uh, not um, you. You probably have a different name for that continent than uh, uh, than is now on the map Britain. Um, so that's that. Uh, I wanted to say and give the floor to you again. Yes. Okay. Well, um, I will be briefly because we have Tom. And I want to, I had this whole like prepared and Tom said, please don't do this. Like, like what, you know, summarize it. So I thought, well, I just met you like now for one hour. Yes. Oh, there's someone, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, she's there. <laughs> I've met you like for one hour and I think you're compassionate, you are humorous. Uh, I think, and I think for sure, that's why we are here, also inspirational. So we need people like you. We need to uh, start listen to elders. We need to start listen to them. And please share your knowledge with us. And we are here. So please all give a big round of applause for Tom. Thank you very much. I'll try to, I need your help though, tonight. 
uh, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to be doing what we call in the Mohawk language, Ohondo Kaihwadehkwa. And uh, sometimes that is referred to as the Thanksgiving address. Sometimes people say it's opening prayer. Sometimes, um, oh, they have all kind of names. Or, and it's not wrong, but it's not exactly right. Ohondo Kaihwadehkwa is the proper term in Mohawk. And when I translate it directly into English, it means this. Ahondo means in the front of it or before. Galihwadehkwa means issues or matters that are important, that which you say before important matters or issue. And so you have to talk about the creator and the universe that we live in before you discuss important issue of any kind or any nature. That's what that's for. And so I want you to help me. And also bear in mind that this, this talk, the spiritual talk, called Ohondo Kai Hwadekwa, is the, the instruction that the Creator gave to the human beings when we were first permitted to live on planet Earth. When the first humans breathed the first time, this was what the Creator told us, how we must be, and this is our instructions. And also at this moment, I'm going to tell you that the same speech that we're going to do together is whenever a Haudenosaunee baby girl or boy is born, the uncles and the father of the baby has to do this speech seconds after the baby comes out of the womb of the mother. They just clear the nose and the mouth from the afterbirth, and then the father and the uncles explain to this brand new baby what the Creator told us how our instructions will be. And this speech, or this spiritual talk, never gets old. It's, it's forever, always new, just like the sun. And how I would like you to help me is that whenever you hear me say, and our mind is agreed, if you agree, you can be an old Mohawk, and you can say, Toll, you know, like the, on your feet, toll. That's the way the old Mohawk talks. But if you don't want to be an old Mohawk and you want to be somewhat stylish, when you hear me say, and our mind is agreed, you can say instead, uh-huh. <laughs> and if you want to be super stylish and modern, you can have a choice when you hear me say, and our mind is agreed, you can say, yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what form that you use. As long as you say something, if you're living, if you're still alive, you're supposed to say something. If not, then the Creator assumes must be your dead. <laughs> okay? So, but before we do this very important thing, I need, and I think it's imperative, very important, that I explain to you in the Mohawk people or in the Haudenosaunee people. And I say sometimes I'm a Mohawk and then other times I say I'm Haudenosaunee. And sometimes people ask me, don't you know what you are? Sometimes you're a Mohawk and sometimes you're Haudenosaunee. Well, I need some explanation then. A Mohawk is a Haudenosaunee because the Haudenosaunee is a confederation of different nations and the Mohawk is one of the member nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. It's like uh, New Yorkers, they'll say they're Americans. Or Californians, they'll say they're Americans. It's okay. So a Mohawk is a Haudenosaunee. Oneida is a Haudenosaunee. 
Unodaka are Hodinashuni, Kayugas are Hodinashuni, and Seneca are Hodinashuni. Okay, now, so amongst the Hodinashuni, when you say God or when you say Creator, what does that mean in your mind, each of you and me? What does that mean? When we say God or creator, what comes in our mind? That question was asked when I was 10 years old to my great grandpa. And I was the interpreter for a professor from one of the main big Ivy League universities in the United States. I was the interpreter for him to my great grandpa. And the professor asked grandpa, what in your mind and definition is God? What is creator when you say that? You want to hear what my grandpa said? What the answer? And it's very important. He said this. You have to have an add-in machine that's bigger than this building, this entire building here. You have to have 300 years time schedule to do this task of what is God, what is creator. Maybe that's long enough, might not be. Then you have to have at least, minimally, 300 people to gather the research and information to define this, what you ask. Because now, what we have to do, these 300 people, is you have to count every human being that's in the North America and South America, every human being that's in the entire continent of Africa, then you gotta count every human being that's in Asia and Europe, and anywhere on the face of the earth, we gotta count them. Even the baby, that was just born five seconds ago, and then put it on that add-in machine and pull the handle. Then you gotta count every river and every creek and every lake and every pond and every ocean in the entire world and put it on the add-in machine and pull the handle. And then you have to count every fish that's in every water and every ocean. And don't forget the one that just hatched two seconds ago, and put it on the machine, pull the handle, and then you gotta count every tree, every bird, every deer, every moose, every animal, every frog, and put it on the machine and pull the handle. And then you gotta count the sun and the moon, then you gotta, at nighttime, count every single stars, and there's billions of them in the nighttime sky. And after 300 years, we must assume that that's a suitable time. Now we have counted everything that lives in the universe. Now we push that big square button at the bottom and that summarizes and totals all those lives. 300 years gathering. And the summarization of all life in the universe is what the real Mohawk calls God or creator. And so that means that the creator isn't just a human being. He's something far bigger, millions of times stronger and bigger and more important than us. Really. And so that creator is part of you and me, and he's in this man, and he's in this woman, and he's in every one of you and me, the Creator. And the Creator is in every tree, and every water, and every wind, every thunder. That's what the Creator is. And so we are never to abuse life, any form of life. We can use different things, but only what we need for today, and we're not to hoard, because our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren needs that too, and we mustn't diminish it. That's what we call it, seven generations far ahead. 
we must plan today that what we do when the seventh, seventh generation grandkids is born, that what we did today, the decisions that we made today will not jeopardize or injure or harm them seven generations when they are born. That's our job as fathers and mothers, as aunts and uncles, as leaders, as prime ministers, as chiefs and clan mothers. That's our job, not to hurt our children. That's what the Creator demands. And so it is, that's the definition of what the Creator is. And so the Creator, yeah, when you and I think of him, we can say he looks like us, but as long as you and I understand that when the deer talks about the Creator or God, that the, the deer is God, and God is the deer. He looks like a deer. When the eagles and the birds talks about God, then God is an eagle. We as humans don't have a pattern on God. He belongs and is a part of every sacred life in the universe. Isn't that wonderful? Because it's the truth. And so now, with that in mind, now we've defined what the indigenous world calls creator God. It's all sacred life in its total. Now we can begin. There were some days ago uh, here in Netherlands, Amsterdam, a call went out to invitate, invite people to come here this evening. I received that invitation. And so like you, I cleared my calendar. I don't want to go to the bowling alley or I don't want to go to the cinema. I want to come here. So I cleared my calendar just like you did because we could have done other things, right? But we chose to come here. And so when that call went out to invite us to come here, now I look around and I see everybody here, good group of people too. And when that call of invitation, this is the result. And I'm going to copy my old chief where I live. He was 97 years old. He goes like this. He starts here and he looks at the women, not the men, just women. And he scanned all the women, not those men, just the woman, all the whole room. And then he goes over here, just woman, not those guys. And all women go all the way around the entire room. And when he finished, you know what he said? All that women in here in this assembly are the most beautiful women in all the world are right here tonight. Then when he finished that, he says, okay, now I'm going to look at all the men. Not the woman, just the men. I'm going to scan it, just the men, all the way around. The whole room, the whole assembly. And I noticed that every man here, and sometime we're lucky, there will be a woman carrying a cradle board with a little baby boy in there. He's included too. And he said, my uncle, you will notice that our men gathered in this assembly are the most handsome guys in all the world. And so when you put all the most beautiful women and the most handsome guys in the world, this group, there's no finer good looking people than this group here tonight. And what do we do about it? We send many thank yous and greetings and love. And that big pile touches the ceiling and the four walls of this room. And then you and I, what we're going to do, we're going to pick it up and throw it into the universe. And we say, Creator, thank you that you allowed this fine, beautiful people to gather together as brother and sister this evening. And that we will rub shoulder with each other in peace and friendship. And also, Creator, we noticed that nobody fell down in the elevator or in the stairs, or nobody got run over by a trolley car or anything. 
or no stone was on our, tr on our path to trip us and we get hurt, but everybody arrives safe and sound and happy. And so, Creator, for that, we say to you, thank you for this wonderful gathering you allowed us to come to in our mind is a greet. And then also now for all the beautiful women and the handsome men that's here, what we do now too is we put thank you and greetings and love on a big pile and then we give it to each other. Thank you, greetings and love because we are brother and sister. And so with love we say hello with love to one another in our mind is a greet. And then it is now what we're going to do is we're going to, where do our feet go when we walk the earth? It's on our mother earth's body. And so the earth is our mother earth. And the creator said that the earth is going to be a special woman. Because the special woman that she is, she has to be the mother of all humans, all the deers and be buffaloes and deers and moose and raccoons and beavers and muskrat. She's got to be the mother of all the trees and all the plants that grow and the corn and strawberries and everything. So she's a special woman because she gives birth to multitude of life. And our grandma said to us as we were kids growing that our mother earth was specially chosen by the creator because she is so multi-talented and she's full of love and compassion. And so since the beginning of time of human memory, this earth has been our mother and she has given us birth from the beginning of time to all life. And when she gave us birth, she put us on her breast and we was breastfeeding from her so we can come strong and crawl and stand up and walk. And then when we became bigger to walk and run on Mother Earth, then from her body grew the corn and carrots and turnips, potatoes and dozens and dozens of food. And she fed us every day, morning, noon and night, and in between snacks too whenever we were hungry, since the beginning of time. That's what our mother has been doing for us, you and I. So when you and I think about her in that context, in that fact, it's not a con, it's a fact, fact. It's undeniable. What a wonderful mother we have. What a gracious, generous mother we have. Because grandma said to us when we were growing that a lot of people in the world have forgotten that the earth is our mother. She said a great number of people does not know that anymore and don't feel like the earth is their mother. We got lost. And she, mother earth, lost us too. And she's lonesome us. And then grandma said also that there are people in the world, not only that they forget Mother Earth and her gifts and nourishment, but there are people in the world that drills thousands of feet into Mother Earth's intestines every day to extract things from her innards. And it hurts our mother. And it hurts this world. And Mother Earth has great pain. And their suffering comes from that, from our mother. But even though humans do that, guess what, Grandma said? We have such a wonderful mother that even though people drilling her in, rip her intestines, she never became angry or mad enough to throw us away or abandon us as her children. She continues to love us and she continues to give us food this morning and today since the beginning. That's the kind of mother we got the creator give us. 
how lucky we are, you and I. And so what will we do? We will gather our mind as one, and we put many thank yous, layers of thank you, layers of greetings, layers of love and compassion and kindness till it touches the ceiling and the four walls of this room. And then you and I, on behalf of our family and our children and grandchildren, will pick up this big pile of thank you, greetings, and love, and we throw it up and grab that big thank you and love, and we gently give it to our mother, the earth. And we say, Mother Earth, your children this evening stands before you with love and compassion, and we say thank you because we are still living and we still are born. Mother Earth, with love, thank you, and our mind is agreed. And then it is what our Creator did at the beginning when the world was new. He made these water in the rivers, in the creeks, in the ocean, and lakes. And our grandma and grandpa told us when we were little kids that the Creator and Mother Earth touched that water. And when he touched that water, the Creator and Mother Earth, a soul and a spirit entered that water. It became a living entity. The same soul and spirit that went into him and to you and to me is the same spirit that's in that water. And so when the creator finished that, he talked to the spirit of the water. And he told the waters of the world, this is your job and your mission. You will come from the clouds in the sky and rain will come on top of the big mountains and hills in rain or snow. And then it will come down the big mountains in the valleys. And when it comes to Amsterdam and Germany and Italy and New York and Rochester and Chicago and Los Angeles, where their people's villages and towns are, passing with cricks from the mountaintops, you will quench their thirst every day without fail. When they are sweaty and grimy, they will take shower, they jump in the river, and they get clean, and they get healthy, and they get fresh, full of life again. And so those waters never stop believing what the Mother Earth and Creator told them to do. They're still moving all over the rivers and creeks all over the world because they're living. They're looking for you and I where we live to give us a quenching of our thirst. And so that water is still doing what the Creator told them to do for the birds, the deers, the bears, and the human. And we are grateful. And so what we will do, we will put many thank you greetings in love until it too touches the ceiling. And then you and I will take some of it and we throw it to the north, the east, the south, and the west. So every creek and every river and every lake and every ocean will receive the human thank you, filled with love and kindness because they quenched our thirst yesterday and again today. On behalf of our children and our babies, waters of the world, we say thank you for making us live and our mind is agreed. And then it is also that our creator, what he did, at the beginning, you see, uh, I don't know if you can believe this or not, but in the original teaching of the Haudenosaunee, our old, old elders told us that a woman came from another planet in the solar system, and she crossed over to this planet Earth and she brought human life here. And that's why, to this day, and since the beginning of time, the Haudenosaunee people and nations have been a matrilineal society, even to this day. Since the first human breathed the first breath, we've been a matrilineal because of that woman began our life. And that lady in our stories came here to this planet 
and from here they placed her in the sky and now she is the moon. But she is the original who was our grandma who began our life on this earth. And then they placed her there to be the moon. And while she is the moon, they call her grandma. We call her grandma moon. You know why? Because grandma moon every 28 to 30 days walks in a big circle and she carries a, a wand like an orchestra leader of a sympathy orchestra. 300 piece violins and all kind of, you know. And he, she uses that stick as she walks 28 to 30 days. And it doesn't matter if it's an English woman, a Dutch woman, or a Mohawk woman, or African woman, or Asian woman. Okay, ladies, every 28, 30, get ready. And I don't care you're rich or poor or who you are. When she says get ready, you're going to get ready. You know why? So that a new blood can come to that woman. And that new blood will become a comfortable new nest or bed, soft, where a little baby human can begin its journey to be born and to live. And that's why the moon does, does this. And that's why we call her grandma. And so she is the one who is responsible for your birth and my birth. And how many kids we have. She's the one who opened the door for them to be born. And so our grandma moon, grandma says, has such a power that she raises the oceans up and down every day with her power. And so to our grandmother moon, we send thank you and greetings and love to her and our mind is agreed. And then also I forgot to remember or to tell you that strawberry came from there, the other world. Our grandma brought it here. And that's what my grandma said. That's why strawberry is the only kind of berry in the world that the seeds grows outside of the berry. All others grow inside because it didn't come from this planet. It came from another planet. And so after the snow of winter, when it melts and the grass gets green on Mother Earth's body wall to wall, the first flower is the strawberry flower. And the first flower turns into a red, sweet strawberry that looks like your heart. The heart of a deer, the heart of a human, the heart of any living thing. And so in our country of Haudenosaunee, when we see that strawberry, the whole nation, national celebration, big ceremony, it called a Strawberry Ceremony Day. And while I was visiting here in Europe for six, seven weeks now, we conducted four strawberry ceremonies in, in some of the German towns and different places in Europe for the first time, I think. And they were grateful because they are asking, how do we get back to the original truths as a European to the original universal truths? How do we reconnect to our mother earth? And how do we reconnect to the sacredness of what the creator made here? And so that strawberry showed them one way. And then next year when the strawberry come, I'm so anxious to see what they're going to do when I'm not here. Will they continue the relation with the power of the strawberry? And if they do, then the sacredness of Mother Earth will be reborn. And so it is, the trees. Now, let's talk about the trees. In the Haudenosaunee, all the trees, there's one tree called the maple tree, a sugar maple tree. My language is called wakta, wakta. Can you say wakta? That's the maple sugar tree. And when the snow goes away from the cold winter, the first tree that comes alive is the sugar maple tree. And the sap runs. And then we drink the sap. And it makes a purifier for our body and cleanses our body. 
and then what's left, we save it, the juice or the sap from the maple tree, and we cook it. And we make maple syrup. And we put it in our puddings, in our food, and it makes it taste the best in all the world. And so that's why the maple tree is considered to be the chief or the main leader of all the trees that makes the forests of the world where we live. And probably here in Europe, I don't know what tree would be your leader for your forest. Maybe it's the oak tree. I'm not sure. But where we live, it's the maple, sugar maple. And so we have a big, two big days of ceremony for the spirit and the power of tree. Because from the trees comes apples, oranges, plums, cherries, apricots, bananas, all kind, pineapple, everything comes from there. Hickory nuts, chestnut, walnut, coconut, and the list goes on and on. And that's what the creator did when he made the trees. So the birds and the animals and the humans will have lots of food. And then you know the last one what he did? He said the trees will make the wind blow. That means they will make the oxygen that you and I and our children have to breathe in order to live. And if the world has no oxygen because the tree is gone, we will die. Our animals will die. Our children will die. And so you see, when you add up all the things that the Creator told the tree to do, it's very important. So that's why I suggest to you tonight that we gather our mind as we were one and put it, thank you, thank you, greetings, greetings and love and love. And we throw that to the four directions of the universe, to the maple tree and all the trees that make the forest of the world. Thank you that the air we breathe is still here. Trees of the world, with love we say thank you tonight and our mind is agreed. And then our Grandpa Thunder that renews the waters and the rivers, put a new water so it won't get stagnant and stale, put brand new fresh all the time, Grandpa Thunder. And they use their fire arrows of lightning to burn the stagnation of the atmosphere. And after thunders and lightning, everybody, Irish, German, Mohawk, they say how sweet the air feels after a thunderstorm because they burn all the impurities and they purify the air we breathe. And that's the job of the thunder. And so, the Haudenosaunee, we got two thunder dances a year, one in the spring when they come back and one in the fall when they leave where we live. We celebrate them. When they leave, we say so long, Grandpa, but don't stay away too long. And as soon as we hear the first thunder, we will gather all our nation and we will dance for you again, and we will communicate with you again, and we will send our greetings and our love to you again so that you continue to make the water new and fresh. And so to the thunder, we say thank you with love, and our mind is agreed. Amen. To the moon, to the sun, who shines miracle every day, we say thank you to them, and our mind is agreed. Amen. And then this one important, important one, that my grandmother loved to say it, and I love it the most, too. You know why? Because grandma and my uncle said that in the beginning of the world, when the world was new, the Creator and the Mother Earth said to you and I and our great-great-grandfather and grandma at the beginning of the world, I don't want you human beings to be walking around on the Mother Earth in sadness and grief. I don't want you to be walking around with your bottom lip hanging down to the ground and then you trip over your sadness and your grief. That's not why I made you. <laughs> Pull your lip up, he said, Mother Earth said, and I want to see you smile, whites of your teeth from ear to ear, three times minimally per day, each one of you. I want to see the whites of your teeth three times per day, minimally. 
That doesn't mean you can't do it 15 times. Mother Earth is more happy if you do. But the memino is three. And in order for this to be the case, I made the birds. And when I made the birds, I put all these beautiful colors on their feathers. So when you and I, the humans, walk, they zoom by our head where we walk with beautiful colors, have joy. And then they gathered, the creator gathered the robins, and he gave them their song, the beautiful song. And then he gathered all the chickadees, and he gave them their song and their melody. And then he gathered all the morning doves, and he gave them the way they sing and their song and rhythm. And he did it to dozens and dozens and hundreds of other birds, all different songs and tunes. And then when he finished, he got the eagle to be the president or the big chief of all the birds. That's called the eagle. And then he told those birds, your job is a special job. Early in the morning when the night is here and the dawn comes in the east, the dawn, not the sun, the dawn, pre, pre the sun, all you birds will get up before the sun shine, just as the light comes, and you will begin to sing as you face the east. You will welcome, O oh brother sun, and the miraculous new day. And you will sing your hundreds of beautiful songs to welcome the sun and the miracle day of the new day. And when you do this, the human beings will hear you singing. The deers and the bears will hear you singing. And you birds will have shaken those human beings' mind so that boredom and lonesomeness will not find a home in their body. But instead, they will hear the beautiful songs of the Creator's wonderful world. And there will be joy and there will be happiness. And so every morning, if you get up, you will hear them. They never stopped what the Creator told them and Mother Earth told them. See how lucky we are? So what are we going to do about it? We put many thank you and greetings in love again until it touches the ceiling and we throw it high into the universe to every direction and we send it to the birds. Thank you, all the birds and the eagle, the leader of the birds, for singing this morning for bringing the beautiful, joyous day again to us and our kids and our babies. Birds of the world, thank you with love, and our mind is agreed. And then it is also now to the stars who are the diamond rings and jewelry of our grandmother moon. Because when she walks at night, she dresses up with beautiful, nice clothes. Every night she goes out and then she puts a diamond ring on every finger, 10 fingers, 10 toes. She's got diamond ring on there. She's got two ears, diamonds hanging on there, and her neck and her wrist and her ankle. That means that the stars are her diamond jewelries as she walks the night sky, ready to give birth to the nations of the world. And then our Creator also made the four sacred beings, the unseen forces. And so to the stars and the unseen forces, they're the ones who guide the geese to fly south and north without getting lost. They're the ones that guide the salmon and all the fish in the big oceans how to go to South America and back up to the North Sea without getting lost. They're the ones, those four sacred unseen forces, to help the Creator to guide the constellation of stars so one constellation will not collide with another constellation and all the universe will be destroyed. It is those unseen. And in the time of history, when our great-grandfather and grandmother lost their original truth, as it has now happened in the world, one of those four sacred beings were summoned by the Mother Earth and the Creator to be born as a little baby several times in our history, both in Asia, Middle East, Africa, Asia, and North America. And peace prophets were born 
to remind us of the original truths. And it's time again for another prophet to come to the world because many people have forgot the original truths. Man has stepped in the front of the Creator and the Mother Earth, and they pushed them aside. And now the rivers are sick. Now the air is sick. Now everything, Mother Earth, is getting weak. And there's a great danger that it cannot return if we continue to push the Creator and the Mother Earth aside. And so within indigenous people, we are the ones that only became colonized by Western powers only 300 years ago in North America. But here in Europe, the European people have been colonized four or 5,000 years ago before us. You are more in need than we are, although I don't know how you can be more or less in need but for us to retrieve our original truth, my grandmother and her cousins and the Haudenosaunee have kept their ceremony going no matter how much colonization came. We hid and we kept it going so nobody will stop it. And I'm so thankful for my grandmother and all the other old ladies of the Mohawk that were so stubborn to continue the Creator's things. That's how come I know what to talk about tonight. That's how come I know how to tell you about the Hondagai Hodeko and the original instruction. And so I'm not here to convert you at all. I'm just asking you to renew your acquaintance with your Mother Earth as I do. Do it in your way, the way Europeans should do it. Renew your relationship with the spirits of the water that surround the world so they will continue to quench the thirst of your family and your children. Give them praise, the water. Give them honor. You don't have to do it the way the Mohawk or Lakota does it. You can re-fast, meditate, and reconnect with the spirit of the water. How does that water want you to make ceremony to say thank you to them? So there will be harmony between you and that water. That's all I'm asking. Because if the Mother Earth stops and the water stops and the tree stops and the sun stops, those are the basis of our spirituality. If they stop, then we stop forever. But even if we stop forever, the humans, that Mother Earth is still going to be here. And that water is still going to be here. And that sun is still going to be They don't need us. At all, they don't need us. We need them. And that's what I'm here to remind you. And so with that, I want to say thank you for the honor of your stillness and your respect as I speak the words of our grandpa and grandma since the beginning of time. Because you were listening so good, it makes me so happy because for many hundreds of years, nobody listens to my grandma and grandpa. And now you listen and it's overwhelming. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm so impressed and I'm so inspired by your words. I think we all are. Um, Max, come. Uh, thank you. And I want to thank especially your grandmothers and their grandmothers as well for being so stubborn. Mm -hmm. Why? Uh, me and George are going to play a flute, which was forbidden under colonialism. And I know the first time when I heard this flute, I wanted to learn to play it because that way I could pass on and share the sound that was, uh, to me at least, so touching. 
Um, so that way I'm also grateful for your grandmothers and so they can be here through uh, having shared that flute as well here. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, and what's also nice about, and the way you talk when we talked during dinner was, uh, was fun because um, I said, well, what's the plan? And you said, well, I, the plan is when I'm standing here to talk and then we'll see where it goes. And it's the same way you play this flute. Uh, the first time I got the instruction book, it says, well, you can learn a song, but actually it's not the way you have to play it from your feeling and from there on go. Um, so that's the way me and George are also gonna play. We don't have a specific uh, plan or song rehearsed, but we're gonna play it together. So I wanna ask George as well, who's a wonderful flute player, who also plays his flute, who I met. Um, and yeah, as far as plans, George, um, um, we did say we're gonna do flute combinations, but while uh, Tom was talking, I was thinking I should play another flute, uh, which is the B. This is my first flute, and it's the only flute that has a name, and that I gave a name at least. And the name is Joyful Spirit, and I think that's the best way to say thank you to Mother Earth for us to have joy. So let's see what happens. Yeah, you can, yeah, okay.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, when I'm thinking about Mother Earth and what you say about she's bleeding, I feel it. I really feel it. So we are here now, and I think uh, it's time for us to express those feelings that we had from your uh, lecture. And I would like to invite you all to uh, I'll ask your questions or have a, if you have a remark, please do so. Join the conversation because we are here now. So is there anyone who would like to start? Yes. We have only one mic, so please give it uh, back to me. <laughs> well, first of all, I just want to say thank you for taking some time to be with us this evening. Um, one thing that... Uh, I noticed that I focused on, as you mentioned, that there was the first woman that came here to from another planet. And I wondered, where does this woman from another planet with these strawberries come from, and why did she leave? Why did she come here? So that's my question. Thank you. Uh, the name of that planet where that she came from, uh, we do know the name of that planet. It's called Galumhiaki. And uh, amongst the Seneca who speak a different dialect than the Mohawk, it's also exactly said the same way, Galumhiaki, in Seneca. Also in Cayuga or Anadaga, who are different dialects too, it's the same uh, Galumhiaki, same word. So because it is a universal truth, even though we speak different languages, that word is not different. It's the same. And uh, that woman that left there, the reason she left there, um, according to a story, and there's different uh, story, everyone who, because we're oral tradition, we don't write things down. Whatever we know, it came because we heard our grandma or uncle or our grandpa or one of the relatives talking about it when we were growing. And everybody, when they remember, tell it in their own version or their own way, in their own mood at the time. But they are th basically all the same with small variances. variances. And uh, one of the things that, um, uh, it's kind of funny and kind of silly too, why she came here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, first, uh, she, she was pregnant when she was there. And uh, when a woman is pregnant, I, I know because I have six kids. My wife has six kids. So I know a little bit about it. And um, when a woman gets pregnant, uh, she has mood swings. <laughs> because uh, when the baby is getting bigger and bigger, inside her are, are dozens and dozens of nerve endings that control or go to her brain and control different parts of her body. And so when this baby gets bigger and bigger and bigger and pushes on those kicks and moves and punches during nine months, it causes those nerve and endings to cause mood swings. Sometimes she's as pleasant as a rose, and other times you would think she was Cassius Clay's cousin. <laughs> and that's what happened to my wife. And that's the way my grandmother told me to expect that, because I was expecting father too. And um, so that's what happened to her. And in that world over there, there was no sun the way we know a sun to be like that's shining right now. Where that place is, is um, there was a tree that grew there, a tree in the middle of the village. This tree that grew there, is called the uh, everlasting tree of life. And on this tree grew uh, peaches and pears and plums and cherries and apples and all kind of fruit on one tree. On one tree. When I was a little boy, that was unheard of. I, I never heard of that. Then when I became a young man, I heard that science people, science who do agricultural things, were starting to graft a tree and put a plum on there and an apple and a peach on one tree. I never heard them ever do that before. And when I heard that, I said, oh, 
No, I heard that before. That was before they came to earth. That's how that tree was. So there's some kind of coincidental thing going on that I had no science to do the research to find out why, because we are oral tradition. So anyway, while she was, uh, so, so the news in town in that place of the next planet where we came from was the creator said, and the mother earth said, don't, don't uh, molest the tree. Kids, don't climb on the tree because you might break the branches. And this tree, because it grew all the fruits on it, was a, a, an energy tree. And so uh, do you remember, or I remember when I was a little boy, they used to have a clock before there was electricity. I was still, uh, I was a little kid when electricity came where we lived. And there was a clock that had numbers on it, and it had a green paint on those numbers. And at nighttime, y you can see the numbers on the clock. There was no electricity. And I always think in my mind that that celestial tree in that Galung was like that clock. Somebody must have painted green on it or something. That's why. And it glowed light day and night. And it was, they used to say, the only source of light they had in that world. And that's why you're not supposed to interfere with the energy of that tree. And... Uh, also, you're not supposed to climb on it or you're not supposed to go pick any of the fruits on there except when the peach is matured, it will fall to the ground and you can go pick, get the uh, peach when it falls, but you can't go pull it. You got to wait till it falls. Oops, excuse me. And then whenever plums is ripe, it will fall to the ground and you go, go get it, see. And uh, but so this one time, this woman who was big now with a baby, uh, she told her husband, husband, I want you to go to that tree in the middle of the village. And I want you to dig at the base of the tree and get the skinny root and then scrape that root and make a tea out of it for me. And I will be so content and happy if you can make a tea out of that little root from that tree. And the husband said, um, uh, well, we're not supposed to molest that tree. We're not supposed to get over there right now. <laughs> she was a demanding wife. Don't forget, we're matrilineal. <laughs> and so he, he, he was more afraid of her than anything else. So he went over there. He went over there. He was obedient. And when he got over there, he, didn't, he got about four, four or five foot from the base of the tree. And there was a hole that caved in. He didn't dig it. It did it by itself. And he jumped back. And now he's really scared. And so he didn't retrieve the root as his wife requested. He went back over there to his wife. And so she said, well, sugar pie, <laughs> where's the root? That I make the tea. I want to make tea, and uh, uh, I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't do it because I didn't even get to the to the tree, and a hole caved in there. Big hole. You can't see the bottom. I should have known better than to send a, send a boneless backbone, no backbone guy over there. I should go and get it my own self. And she didn't believe him, so she went over there. And she, she didn't believe her husband or her man or whatever he was. Because I don't know if they had marriages in those days. Maybe they're just shacking up or something. I don't know. <laughs> but regardless, they're having baby. So that's married, the way we look at it. So she went over there and she looked and she, oh, yeah. It's true what, what my husband said. Wow. <laughs> so she got on her hands and knees and she looked really good at that hole. And that wasn't good enough because she was kind of a nosy woman. <laughs> so then she stuck her head right in a hole and she go like this. She really looking at that hole because you can't see the bottom. And while she was so nosy, busy being nosy, the grains of that dirt was caving in all the while and she was preoccupied looking, being nosy. And pretty soon, 
it had gotten so big before she realized, and she began to fall. And as she noticed her, the thrill of falling, she grabbed whatever she could grab, but she continued to fall because it was too late. And she, she grabbed a strawberry plant from there. That's why earlier I told you, strawberry came from there. And also she grabbed the seeds from peaches, peach tree. And she grabbed also the, the roots from a raspberry plant. So those three came from that planet, not the earth. And she brought that with her here. And as she come down through the sky, through the atmosphere like that, coming towards this earth, I guess, and um, the only things that were living here on the planet Earth that was covered with water, there was no c continents here yet, were, were birds that had uh, webs on their toes, or uh, beaver, uh, muskrat that's got webs on their toe, or any animal that has water, uh, prepared for water, live here. But any other animal like deer or cow or anything like that, they don't have web, so they weren't, they're not, they weren't, they came way later. They were made later. And so those birds seen her, and when they looked up seeing her, you know how those geese or blue herons fly in a V formation? They looked up and they seen this human being falling down, head over heels, and they said, oh my God, what is that? <laughs> so the, you know, bird or horse or deer is very curious. They want to go find their nosy too. So they go fly over there and they look at her. She's got no scales. On, uh, on her skin. She's got no webs on her toes or her fingers, so they know she's not a water person. So she's going to die when she gets there. So they grab her and put her on their back on a soft feather and brought her gently down here and put her on the top of a turtle. And then the turtle became, because she was from that planet, she began to dance like this in a circle. Count, uh, counterclockwise and as she began to dance that turtle grew bigger and bigger and it turned into the earth and then later on because of certain things in creation there was a re request made for the turtle to be broken up and so that's how come they became an Africa in a Europe in a North America so if you look on a map and if you push the continents together, they all fit. So it backs up that story. Although the story is symbolic, but nevertheless, even if it is symbolic, geographical formations uh, back it up that there, there's a truth to it. And so that's a sort of a shortest answer I can give you. <laughs> 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 well, let's keep in mind, who has one other question because we also need to go to the panel so we have really like one question so who 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 yes we we have a panel afterwards okay. so <laughs> well thank you tom um i was very curious when your grandfather and you were the translator to the professor about the in response to the question what the creator means this could be also symbolic for Western scientists coming to learn from your wisdom. What did the professor do with this wisdom? I don't have the slightest idea because we, <laughs> we, we never seen them after that. <laughs> never. But, but I do tell you this, when he came there, um, he, he had a, a tailor's tape, you know, the, like a made out of cloth. And uh, he asked uh, my great-grandfather if he could measure his head with the tailor's tape. And then he asked me, because I'm 10 years old, if he could measure my head with the tailor's tape. And because uh, Grandpa said yes, I said yeah too. And then he asked my grandma, and my grandma, that, that great-grandfather, that was her uncle. And if my grandmother was living today, she would be 130 years old, and that was her uncle. I was 10. So, so when I asked my grandmother, that professor man wants to measure your head, 
And she said right away, no way. <laughs> not going to do it. You can do what you want, but she's not going to touch my head. That's what her answer was. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you know what else he said? <laughs> hey, hey. Oh, you know why he was measuring, I think? Because he was trying to figure out the size of the European people's head and then compare it to the size of our man's head. And then, you know what he asked me to ask my grandfather? Here's what he said. I'm telling you this is true. And he, he said, where my grandmother lives, you can see the Adirondack Mountains. Because if you drive by car, you'll get to the Adirondack Mountains within, within 45 minutes. So you can see the outline of the Adirondack from my grandmother's back door. So he said to me to ask Grandpa, do you see that one big mountain over there? He's talking about the Adirondacks. Bigger than the other ones? Yeah? Ask your Grandpa if I tell him, if I give him a basket or some kind of contained basket, he said basket, and he was to take this basket over there, and he were to take that mountain apart, that big one, piece by piece and put in a basket and take it over that way and dump it, how many times would he dump that basket till that mountain is gone, level with the ground? He asked me to ask Grandpa that question. <laughs> so I asked him, it took me quite a while to get it because my grandfather was deaf. <laughs> and he was almost blind. So, but he could see, yeah, a little bit. So when I talk to him, I have to go in front of him and I talk Mohawk language. And if I talk Mohawk, he can read my lips and he can, if he sees it enough, he can understand what I'm asking. So I really make my lips really talk good. <laughs> and then when I finish, finally he said, he clapped his hand and he danced a little bit, my grandpa. He said, that means I now understand what he wants. And he goes like, shake his, scratch his head, and he look at that white man, and then he look at that mountain, he look at that white man again, and then he says, oh, it's not even hard to answer his question. That's what he told me. So he said, you tell him, that man from the university, that I will do it only one time if he gives me a basket big enough. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Um, I think it's time for the panel. So it's time for us to have this conversation together. Um, I wonder, is this like a nice seat for you or do you prefer to have your seat here or it's up to you what you want? <coughs> because I think it's maybe too high or you prefer to sit? No, no iron worker. So you can, okay, great. <laughs> well, Shirlene, please come. Sir, please come. And Tom, please enjoy <laughs> their seats here. So choose your seat. <laughs> I will first introduce Serf. Serf is here, and he has been engaged with indigenous people since childhood. That's true. Yeah. So that's very interesting to know. And at present, he's the vice chairman of the Foundation Nanai. That's the Netherlands Association for North American Indians. And he's also the author of books of various uh, international subjects. And his latest book is titled, sorry, it's in Dutch, Veerkracht Indianen van nu over de wereld van morgen. So he was also a diplomat, so I'm always curious about how to be a diplomat or how was it, but we have spoken a little bit about it, so that's very nice. And you have been traveling uh, and working all over the world. So thank you for being here. And thank you uh, for inviting I, me. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and uh, here's my lovely friend, uh, Charlene, Charlene Sanchez. Uh, she works for the Earth Charter and with her own organization, A Touch of Spirits. So she works on sustainable event management and is involved with indigenous communities in the Netherlands and also with the Nature Narrative Series, just like me. So also very happy to have you here. You. 
and of course, we all know Tom. So, <laughs> thank you so much. Of course, we have many questions, but the first question I would like to ask you is, um, would you like to respond briefly to the lecture of Tom? Should I start? Sure. Mm -hmm. First, I want to say thank you so much. I can listen every day to Indigenous Wisdom. Your spirit is such an embrace for us, and I think um, I'm very happy that you show a reflection of the treasure God gave us, or the Creator gave us, of the things we think for granted, or we see as simple, but we need to respect every day. Thank you so much for the reflection. Thank you. Um, well, what, what I think is, is uh, I mean, you're here at a great moment, and what was maybe most striking uh, to me uh, is that you said, uh, well, before, just people didn't listen to us. People didn't listen. And of course, the whole story you're telling about the university professor is, is a great, it's a funny story, but it's also a very sad story. It's the way uh, other people, white people, you want to call it the mainstream society, looked at you you as indigenous peoples, as Mohawk people, um, was, was very, well, uh, maybe you were at the best of curiosity, but, but maybe you we were, we were primitive. Um, uh, and now I think we see a change. Uh, we see that uh, we, the mainstream society, is more and more taken seriously. True. And maybe actually we are the primitive ones. Uh, if you see uh, what we're doing with the earth, when we talk about biodiversity, when we talk about climate change, so I think there is a huge movement now, there is, and we are not there yet, so we're definitely not there yet, but I see some things changing, and, and, and you're touching upon that subject. I mean, that's also why I think it's just very important that you are here and you're talking to us and to, to the Germans and the Austrians, and, and please continue. I agree, I agree. I think that the spiritual essence is so important. I definitely think that we need spiritual guidance to build cultures of life. So I see it as a gift. Mm -hmm. And well, it's, it's th true. Thank I think you. The same thing that yeah. uh, Surf is saying, there is a spiritual paradigm going on now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's getting more accepted. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think so too. And I think it's very interesting also to introduce your book now because you have mm. wrote a book. And yeah. I'm curious about uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the book? Yes, yeah, I would love to. Well, the. Um, uh, I've been involved with um, indigenous issues for a very long time as a, a small child. Um, and you were translating for your, uh, for your uh, grandfather. Um, I was watching TV when I was young and I saw that the uh, American Indian movement was, was liberating Wounded Knee. And I was surprised, I was shocked. And I was small, but I, I knew some, some kind of fight was going on. I mean, clearly this was about Indian lands. And, and, and the Americans were shooting at Indians on Indian land, so I knew there was some, some kind of injustice going on, but again, I was small. Uh, now later on, uh, just only two years ago, uh, Indians, uh, the native people from the Americas, uh, reappeared on the front page of newspapers. It was Standing Rock. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was, an, again, something happening over there, and I was very interested because Indians were, or indigenous peoples were back in news, uh, but in a different way. It was not only about their rights, about reclaiming their land. It was about uh, much more. It was about uh, a different way of, of, of dealing with the earth, a different way of dealing with creation. Um, uh, and I think uh, there was so much attention for what happened at Standing Rock. I mean, of course, it was started with Lakota people, but Mohawk people went there, people from all over. Mm -hmm. uh, the Americas went over there, and even non-native people went all over there. So something was happening. It was a movement. Uh, and I think it was um, um, it was so attractive to many people because of discussions that started here, uh, because of Paris, because of the climate agreements, uh, because we were uh, starting to realize that the way we're working now is is not longer sustainable. You went also to the United States, right? Yes. Yeah, so to be so part I of had been, of course I had been there before meeting mm -hmm. uh, meeting uh, Indian people in North America, but now I specifically went to go to the, the the, the, like the main characters of the Standing Rock movement and, and, and talk to them and ask them why 
Were you willing to die over a oil pipeline? Mm -hmm. Why do you, did you want to give your life? Why was it so emotional? Why was it so important? Why was it so spiritual? I mean, because we here, of course, we also have an environmental movement. We also have activists. Mm -hmm. But you, do you want to die for an oil pipeline? What's, what's going on? What, what does it mean? So, um, and, and although I'm long already involved in Native issues, I kind of discovered, or I found out, that it's, uh, it's about, um, well, as you said, it's about spirituality. Mm -hmm. It's about a very deep felt relationship with the rest of creation. Um, uh, th so my book was actually about that, about, about um, uh, listening to, to, to native voices from North America, listening to why uh, it's important mm -hmm. for them, uh, and also, of course, what we can learn from it. Okay. Because, yeah, we need, I guess, so and more of that. We need a paradigm shift ourselves. Is that something that you have learned while writing this book, that we need to have like a kind of different paradigm? Uh, or what is your main learned lesson? Yeah, um, well, well, so much. But one thing I learned, and it's also actually what, what, what uh, Tom just said, um, is that there's a, uh, a different way of thinking, or maybe it's not thinking, it's feeling, mm. whatever you want to go. It's a different mindset in, in, in native people in North America. Uh, and um, I think it's partly because it's, it's a unique culture, and they could say every culture is unique, but in a way it was uh, a culture by itself for a very, very long time. I mean, there have always been exchanges uh, between Europeans and Africans and, and Asians, and it has been there for thousands of years, there have been exchanges. However, in, 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 in the Americas, specifically, of course, in North America, it took a long time before, of course, they were uh, uh, exchanging ideas among themselves, but it took a long time before they get the external influences. So in a way, the uh, native culture is kept um, special, original, unique mm -hmm. for a very, very long time. So when you go back now to, to, to North America, in a way, it's all recognizable. They, people drive cars, people wear jeans, whatever, they look on the iPhone, uh, that's the same thing. But if you sit down and talk and listen, listen, mm -hmm. like two people like Tom, I've been meeting many spiritual leaders, then you feel a different way of thinking. And that's what I learned from the book, so it's, it is different. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't, say, don't say that we have to copy it, but it's so worth listening to. I think we can exchange. I think that's the whole part of yes. exchanging ideas. Mm -hmm. And from maybe we speak different languages or we have different ideas, mm -hmm. but we can blend them. I yeah. think we should. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And um, uh, Charlene, um, yeah, you of course are indigenous and you have like a very interesting work you do. So what are activities uh, you mainly do like on a daily basis? What are the activities? Uh, well, I organize events for organization who creates a sustainable and uh, peaceful uh, impact. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the or one of the, uh, one of the organizations is the Earth Charter. Maybe one, all of you found uh, a flyer on your seat. Uh, and the Earth Charter is an ethical framework uh, building uh, for building a sustainable and peaceful uh, global society. Mm -hmm. um, it's all about um, finding a, f a sense of um, global interdependence and um, and. Um, sharing our global responsibilities. And can you tell us a little bit more about your roots? So, like, uh, what is the name of your community? Well, I was born in Suriname. Um, I'm, I'm mixed race. Uh, my mom is from the Kalinya tribe in South America, and they're still resident in South America today. Um, but different, like uh, the North Americans, uh, because of the colonial time, a lot of our wisdom has been lost. And um, so that's why I think that decolonizing is now the time for us to rebuild our spirit and get in touch again with our indigenous wisdom. Is it hard being an indigenous female uh, living in a Western society? Uh, do you feel like you are squeezed in the two worlds or can you bridge them? Um, I feel enriched because of my indigenous wisdom. Definitely, my mom is a real proud woman. She always told me to be proud. <laughs> and, um, but it somewhere feels also a bit incomplete um, because I don't know my language mm -hmm. and um, everybody knows the importance of what language means for a culture. Um, 
but it also gives me the opportunity to get to know myself and to find out who I am and what it means to be indigenous. And I think that's so important that every person, doesn't matter if you're indigenous or not, should look for the path of themselves. Why are you here? What is your connection? What is your connection with the land? Because I was born in Suriname, mm -hmm. but my land is here in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. This is where my roots grow. Mm -hmm. This is where we should know the land. That's my identity. That's really amazing to say because also I feel like sometimes uh, you're indigenous but you do need to live here. This yes. is the Western society yes. so we do need to adapt yes. and I think uh, we do need to have this shift in the mindsets. Sometimes uh, when I think about my mountains in Chile, I think about my grandmother of course with no electricity so I know how to make fire. But uh, those skills aren't useful, I thought, uh, in the Western society. But oh. now I'm thinking, well, they are useful. I think we should, you know, embrace those kind of skills. Maybe yeah. not really uh, um, uh, literally, but to make the most of it, to uh, feel happy with simplicity. simplicity. I think this is like yeah. my key message for me. Like. Uh, feeling <coughs> good with simplicity, exactly. keep life simple. Yes. And uh, this is like my feeling being indigenous in the Western society. Do you have also this kind of feeling that you sometimes you have to uh, you know, adapt or you have to sometimes uh, lose some of your identity maybe? Do you have the same kind of feelings? <coughs> <laughs> I, I'm so busy uh, all the time with um, the teachings that I'm doing like I did tonight, that I don't have time to think about what you said. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. So I, I know because I'm always working on it and learning more and, under, and, and so sometimes we do things and we don't understand the source. Mm. What does it really mean? Yeah. And that's what sort of my job is because I, I because I, speak my language, uh, it help, it's helpful because I can take a word, a words and it helps me to understand that which somebody doesn't explain mm. just by taking a word. For instance, when we say father, uh, like if he was my father, I talked to him, I would say lagani. That means, it doesn't mean father or daddy, it means when I talk to him and say lagani, I'm saying to him, you loaned it to me I'm living. Mm -hmm. So before you talk to your, your father, you gotta tell him, you're the one loaned me my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. It's on loan. Mm -hmm. So that's why I have to be careful because it's not really my life. It belongs to him. Mm -hmm. He only mm -hmm. loaned it to me. Yes. And then you loan it to your kids. And then when we say mother, we say Ishtan. That means you're saying to your mother, you are my power. You are my strength. That's when you say mother, Ishtan, my, my power, my strength. Yeah. <laughs> so I was more telling, uh, what's his name too, or earlier, Hubert, that uh, when a man, old, a man gets old, or a woman gets old, we say, Wahokstahane, means that she was carrying a heavy load and it got heavy on him. That's why we call it an older man. It got heavy on him, what he was carrying. And if it's a woman, it got heavy on her, what she was carrying. That's what it means. It got heavy on her. So that implies that us younger ones have to help carry what's heavy her. So sure. it's within the culture, the language, it tells you. Yeah. You don't mm -hmm. have to be instructed. You just got to know how to talk mm -hmm. and just think and it'll tell you. Are there more people here in the audience with indigenous uh, roots yes. or I see someone? <laughs> <laughs> and how do you uh, feel? Can I give you the mic to give you a short, like, um, yeah, I'm just curious uh, how you think about all this, all his messages and... Uh, hi, hello, I'm Victor. I'm also from Suriname and Shailene and I, we share our common we share the interest in trying to advance the um, the spiritual values of our natives of, of Suriname. And what strikes me is that all the things that you have said today give me the sense of a universal 
philosophy that has been uh, adamant throughout the whole continent because we also, in Suriname, uh, revert to the four directions. Yes. We also have that the women are the carriers of wisdom. Yes. That is also very, very fundamental in our philosophy in Suriname. And also that the, um, the simple things that you know, as you said, are very important because it, knowing how to make fire brings you back to, this, to the essence of what we as humans are. Because if you can make fire, then you understand how dependent you are to your surroundings. So when I hear this saying, I feel that it is uh, as, uh, uh, excuse me, Sheriff, Sheriff yes. was saying that um, there was a very strong and very uh, intricate set of philosophies for all the different nations. And thank you for mm -hmm. bringing this to Europe also. Um, in the light of the seventh generation principle you were talking about, um, if we look at the future, what are the biggest opportunities for, for example, my grandchildren or your grandchildren? Can you enlighten something about that? What are your thoughts about it? Well, I, when you say seven generations, for the Iroquois people, the Haudenosaunee people, it's in our constitution and our constitution is probably 2,000 years old. And it says in there, uh, whatever our, our leaders make a decisions, that uh, it can't be for today or tomorrow. Yeah. It has to be uh, that our leaders use their foresight and their spirituality foresight to see not tomorrow or the next day, but seven generations from them their grandchildren that will be born, that what decisions they will make in council today will not injure or hurt any of their grandchildren seven generations from today. So that includes pollution of water, yes. pollution of air, cutting down of trees that make oxygen for us to breathe. It, it has implications of all the natural world because the natural world, remember the definition of God and creator? Mm -hmm is the natural world, mm -hmm. is the universal mm -hmm. truth. That's what God is. So shall we attack God? So our job is, is for the seventh generation to always understand that up to the seventh generation, to teach them, to give them tra traditions, simple traditions, because those simple traditions reinforce the production of the next seventh generation. After that seventh generation is here, then the next. But in a Western society, that's sometimes difficult. I mean, I'm talking, I'm thinking about politicians. I mean, they have elections. I mean, they have like the short minded, the, the short mindset. So, uh, what can we do about that? Uh, send about five million women to guide them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're not joking either. No. <laughs> <laughs> serious. And, and Sarah, you have spoken mm -hmm. to many, many leaders. Mm -hmm. So, what were their um, ideas about the threats, like of nowadays, but also the threats of maybe like hundred years from now on? Yeah, I think uh, um, uh, as uh, as uh, Tom also said, and I've heard this also from many uh, Indian leaders, they're not they're not preaching that they don't try to convert us, mm -hmm. but they really, really care. And they really are concerned. Uh, we are now in a time with climate change. We see extreme weather, not only there in North America, but also, uh, also here and in other places. So definitely we should, we should change. And, 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 and yeah, that's, that's the message they want to get out, all of them, mm -hmm. all of them. Mm -hmm. And um, when we're thinking about the relations to nature, you have spoken to them. Does it, uh, ch have it changed your uh, relationship with Mother Earth? Do you see Mother Earth more um, uh, concrete yeah. or what are your ideas about that? Yes, I, th I think also personally, I mean, I've, I've, I've met uh, uh, 
people in people in North America was that they uh, I saw actually uh, a woman crying when she was talking about uh, fracking, schaliegas winning fracking. Mm. The fact that the earth was destroyed by uh, injecting chemicals and getting the gas out, she was crying about this. I spoke someone. Someone who said, "Well, um, when we're making sweat lodge, we have to dig into the earth to get the earth out." But that you also that we don't like because then we are actually uh, um, touching the earth. We are actually uh, uh, putting um, a shovel in, in, uh, in the, bell, the bell, belly of our mother. So uh, I said that's, that's when we cry. So I thought it was to me actually it was it was uh, something of a change that people really get emotional about us, about the earth, about protecting the earth, not for their own interests, not for the interest of today or tomorrow. But for the longer term interest, about seven generations. And well, of course, to be, I think that's moving, that's moving. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to the audience, um, are there any questions now that you would like to ask? Because we are here now and time is, you know, it's like evening. <laughs> so, um, who can I give the mic? Yes. Good afternoon. And I was standing here uh, in the, well, <laughs> near the water, near the sun, and near the, the 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 wind. So I only want to to say I saw when you were speaking uh, on the moon and how she came uh, to this uh, place. And I was seeing a beautiful rainbow. So that is uh, wow. my only message. Wow! Wow! Beautiful. Good sign. Good sign. We are we were not alone here. That yeah. brings me, that reminds me of your vision, because you were here and you spoke about, you had a vision. Can you please enlighten really shortly, really briefly, <laughs> 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 your vision? Sorry. You are asking for a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, try to be brief. Uh, so it's quite detailed, but I'm going to just give you the facts. In my vision in December, uh, believe it or not, that the radio spoke in Mohawk to me that in a car radio, but I was traveling to a convention in Toronto, a world uh, environmental c convention, and I didn't know what I was going to do. And I questioned, why am I going there? And the radio started to talk. Mo it was a woman talking. And then I shut the radio off, and the, and the woman kept talking. So it wasn't the radio. It was, a, it was a, I don't know what you call it, but it was a supernatural kind of uh, experience. And here's what it says simply. It says, I am your mother, the mother of all living things. And so I know it's Mother Earth. And she said, the reason I'm talking to you is because you've been asking why are you going to that World Environmental Conference in Toronto? So I heard you as you asked that question and that's why I'm talking to you. So when you get over there to Toronto, if, if they open the door for you to address the people that's coming from all over the world, you give them this message, what I'm telling you. And here's the message. It said, on the day that uh, it's a half day and half night, twice a year, this occurs. When the day is half night and half day, I want you, she was pointing to me, you and your wife and all your kids and grandchildren to gather your family, your immediate family at your house on that two days of the year, it's half day and half night, and you and your wife prepare a food for all your family on those two days from sunrise to sundown. Don't drive a car. And don't drive a tractor either, she said, because I got tractor where I live. <laughs> and she said, don't drive a tractor the whole day from sunrise to sundown. But she said, you can ride a bike, you can ride a canoe on the Mohawk River, or you can walk the trails in the, in the mountains that's behind my house with your family. And on that day, you will eat together and you will love each other as a family should. And then you tell your family, your kids and your grandkids, who I am, that I'm their mother. Because almost all my children in the world have forgotten who I am. 
and they don't know me anymore, and I am lonesome for them. So you gather your family and catch a new talent the who I am, their Mother Earth, and what do I do? How do I help them? How do I feed them? How do I nourish them? And how do I love them? So that they will love me back. So, and when you tell them, don't make them ashamed to do it. Don't put a guilt trip on them. But you tell them, that's what I said, only if they have the desire to have these two days set aside to honor and love their mother and to reacquaint their self. And then the healing can begin and dialogue can begin for true. And then the healing journey begins. That's as simple as that. And so I give that to you. And again, not to make nobody afraid or make feel somebody feel guilty if they don't only if you want to do it. Beautiful. Thank you. There's one lady waiting. She has already the mic. So we, uh, there, are, there are many people want to ask here some questions. So very short, please. OK, I hope I'm not opening Pandora's box with this question then, though. <laughs> well, thank you so much for giving me the mic. And thank you all for being in this panel. Uh, Tom, this question is directed to you, because one thing that you said uh, really struck me, um, and I'm interested to learn a bit more about it. You said that you are very grateful because you're, um, you are still connected with your ancestry since North America or the Americas got colonized 300 years ago, but for here in Europe, we have lost our traditional ways um, since 4,000 years back. Can you please reflect on what you mean by that exactly? Yeah, so it's uh, real <coughs> easy. <laughs> um, here in Europe, uh, you, you had, before, before the colonization came, before the spirit was taken out of the Mother Earth, away from her, and, and given just to mankind. Before that, uh, I know the Irish, the Scottish, the English, the Polish, the German, the Austrians, the Italians had a moon dance for our grandmother, the moon. And they practiced it very religiously. I know that all the European people four or 5,000 years ago had a sun dance, the way North America still does it today. But yours was done 4,000 years ago. I know that you had ceremonies for the rivers and the waters. I know you had ceremonies also for little tiny people called uh, leprechauns and whatever. We still do that <laughs> in North America. And it's real. It's not fairy tales. Yes. It's healing for people. That's what I'm talking about. That you have to take all the dust and the dirt off from those universal truths. And I call them universal truths because you can't, you and I cannot live or our children cannot live without drinking water every day. That's a universal truth. We cannot live without the sun shining on our corn and our food in our garden or we die. That's a universal truth. We cannot live without the moon to raise the waters of the ocean and make children born every month. We can't, that's a universal truth. So okay. what we have to do is take all the dirt and dust away in Europe and all the world, get back to the universal truth, who is our real universal family. Thank you, thank you. Um, People, we don't have much time. Actually, we don't have time anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do. Uh, I want to ask you one more question. Please stand up, all. Please stand up, all. Should we stand and up as well? I will like you to make a promise to Mother Earth. We are now here. Make a promise to Mother Earth. Maybe you do it in your mind. Maybe you want to uh, uh, say it loud, but to protect her because she is bleeding and she needs us. Please think about her as maybe your grandmother, a mother, or someone you really care, and make sure that you will not fail her. I think that's the message that uh, I uh, think about when I hear your story and your story and your story. So please 
don't fail Mother Earth and go back to your home and be motivated. I think it's also joyful to uh, protect a mother. So it is not like we go back and we go crying, no. It's like do it with joy and do it with gratefulness. I think that's the whole idea of this evening. So thank you so much for all, for your efforts, for being here. And thank you audience for being here. And thank you so much uh, Mother Earth for having us here safely and let us go home in peace. Thank you. Small reminder, there is a bar, so uh, if you want to have some drinks, he's also there, so we are there, so please uh, keep an eye on the agenda of Parkhuis is Weigen, especially uh, uh, nature narratives, because this is like not, this is the beginning, this is only the beginning. So please, I hope to see you uh, downstairs.